Return by Grieg. Please remain seated for the call to worship. I'll read the light print. The Lord is robed in majesty. You, O God, have established the earth. The mountains lift up their praise to you. You are mightier than the breakers of the sea. Our first hymn will be a change from what is in the bulletin. We'll be using the red hymnal, number 679. And please stand when you are asked to. For the first verse, if you are a veteran of the Navy, Coast Guard, or Marines, please stand and we'll sing the first verse. See. 
please be seated. For the second verse, if you're a veteran of the Army, the National Guard, or the Border Patrol, please stand. Verse 2. be seated for the third verse veterans of the air force space force police fire and first responders please stand verse 3 <laughs> Everyone stand for verse 4, please. Thank you. You may be seated. In your bulletin, you will see on a blue piece of paper a little of the history that Ed has compiled about Memorial Day, and it's well worth your reading. Traditionally, it was always on the 30th, and guess what it is this year? The 30th, tomorrow. Every now and then, it falls that way. Our invocation. In this time we worship you with love and awe. Our love is offered to you, for you have first loved us in your, sen in your sending the Savior to die for us. Our sense of awe is felt, for we see the majesty of the creation all around us and the beauty of his life. Make us wise and understanding in word and action. Accept the worship of our hearts and minds this day through Jesus. Amen. We'll now move to the black hymnal 282, Every Time I Feel the Spirit.
please join me in the reading of the confession. Loving God, we have accepted your forgiveness with gladness. You have refreshed our souls. Now we offer again to you our sin that you might continue your wonder of grace. Forgive us, Lord, and guide us in the way of the life of Jesus. Loving God, grant us your mercy that we may in turn show mercy and compassion. So we pray, amen. As we draw near to God, we find God has drawn near to us. Drawing near to Christ, we discover Christ has drawn near to us. Dear God, as your children, baptized and cleansed, we accept your forgiveness and mercy. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We'll begin our scripture lessons responsively with Psalm 97 from the bulletin. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. Fire goes before the Lord, burning up enemies on every side. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens declare your righteousness, O Lord, and all the people see your glory. Confounded be all who worship carved images and delight in false gods. Bow down before the Lord, all you gods. For you are the Lord, most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the honest of heart. Our second lesson is from the book of Revelation. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift, the one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. 
Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Please stand for the chorus. We continue with our study this year from the book of John. Jesus prayed, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me <coughs> may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This concludes the reading of the gospel. Please be seated. And at this time, we have special music today.
ladies very well done it is my pleasure to introduce our guest minister today uh, he's no stranger to Arizona please welcome dr. Ed Nelson Hey, this little thing's on. Well, needless to say, it's been an interesting time. <laughs> two vacation weeks and two sick weeks, and uh, hopefully things are resuming somewhat normal behavior patterns. Uh, Jay, David has the same sort of experience in his trip down to to the Galapagos and went to the COVID mess and he got held up in the Holiday Inn for what was it, a week or so? And uh, finally found some books in English. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah, we had, uh, it was quite a trip. Very, very wonderful because we went through central Utah and saw the na national parks, beginning with Bryce and moving across the Grand Staircase all the way over to Arches and then down to, what is that called, Monument Valley, and then making it around. And it, it, was, it was such a trip that Lois even drove for part of it, you know. <laughs> I really got desperate. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, oh, really bad. I wanted to look at the passage that we didn't read today because it's just one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. And that's the story of Paul and his part of his evangelistic story, uh, of Luke's, I should say, evangelistic story about Paul's work in Philippi. It's in your, it's in your handout here on the first page, beginning at L Acts 16, 16 to 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized, seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city, they are Jews, and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. And just a sidelight here, Philippi had become a Roman colony and had been rebuilt as a Roman colony probably in the century uh, just before Paul got there. So when he got there, it was a, must have been a very, um, very beautiful city. I mean, they, all the limestone and everything had been fresh and it had to be pretty nice. 
but it dedicated to Rome. And anyone who lived there was automatically a citizen of Rome. And they had the privileges of, as if they lived in Rome. And uh, so when they say, you know, it's uh, advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans, I mean, they really were. They were Roman citizens. And it was uh, something they took great pride in. Uh, well, the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the inmost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. By killing himself, he saved the magistrate the trouble. Uh, anyway, but Paul cried out in a loud voice, shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds, and then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. <coughs> a hardened old Roman jailer who had spent time probably as many of us, much of his life as a Roman soldier and was retired to Philippi and given that position as a jailer. Interesting convert. <coughs> Darn. Anyway, um, I dedicate this to John, Jan. I ran across a story about a Chinese gentleman who was visiting the United States. <clears throat> His host took him to play golf. It was a brand new experience for him. It generally was for me each time I went out as well, but that's different. <laughs> <clears throat> when he returned to China, a friend asked what he had done in the United States. He replied, I played a most interesting game. I hit a little white ball with a long stick in a large pasture. Always reminded me of my dad who called it cow pasture pool. <laughs> What's this game called? Asked his friend. And the Chinese gentleman thought for a minute and said, I think it must be called, oh no. <laughs> ah, I know that game. <clears throat> Again, there was a certain golfer who told his caddy he would move heaven and earth to be able to break 100 on the golf course. The caddy, who had gone 15 agonizing holes with this poor guy, replied, well, you better start trying to move heaven because you've been moving earth all afternoon. <laughs> it hasn't gotten you anywhere. <laughs> oh. Well, <clears throat> the story in Acts talks about a prayer that moved heaven and earth. Paul and Silas had been thrown into prison, and the reason for their incarceration is they had freed a young woman of a demonic spirit, as is identified in scripture, uh, the name uh, of Apollo, who was, the, who was the same God who allegedly inspired the Delphic Oracle in her work uh, in Delphi. I mean, the woman was following, Jesus, following Paul around and saying, you know, but these are men who proclaim the way of salvation. But Paul got so annoyed, he turned around and spoke to the spirit and I, I, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. For Paul, <laughs> any 
any advertisement wasn't a good advertisement. It had to come from a proper source. But anyway, they presented the problem for the slave girl's owners because they'd lost their source of income. And so as you have heard the story, they took them before the magistrates. The magistrates heard their story, didn't even evidently interview Paul and Silas at all. And as a result, they were beaten and put in stocks in the innermost prison. It's always interesting to me in this story to see how Paul and Silas respond to this treatment. Um, I can't imagine going into a city and encountering this sort of behavior towards me. I mean, it can be done in this world uh, for certain people who live in certain areas of the country, uh, of the world, I should say. But it, you know, it's just hard to imagine. And then to wait, kind of wake up in the middle of the night and start praising God and singing songs has kind of reflects that there's must something that is truly alive in us that at all times will move us to the center of our being to the, and to the center of our worship, who is God. And so they responded with, as it says, they were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Uh, there's a story I ran across in 1972 a Colonel Robert Certain, his plane was shot down over Hanoi, Vietnam. Certain and two other members of the crew were the only survivors. They were taken prisoner and held in the infamous Hanoi Zoo for 101 days before being liberated. Colonel Certain tells of a time when he and his fellow prisoners were holding a morning worship service in the prison camp. One of the guards approached the group and asked why they would bother worshiping a god who wasn't going to rescue them. Well, the response was, what makes you think we are in prison? God has taken us out of this place and set us free. And there is nothing you can do to really imprison us. You can hold our bodies for a time, but you will never, never imprison our hearts and our minds. And I thought that response from this man was just an amazing response uh, before the prison guard. And by the way, after coming home from Vietnam, Colonel Certain became an Air Force chaplain. And then he came and served as James, an Episcopal priest, for the rest of his life in the United States. One aspect of the story that kind of struck me as I was dwelling on it a bit is that Lois and I felt prayers of praise and joy throughout the trip. I'm, I'm sure you have, you do the same thing. You drive through a beautiful section of the country and you just can't help but think, thank you, God, for the beauty and for the processes that brought this together and for the way this, what I see affects my mind in such positive, wonderful ways. It's just all this interconnectedness that God has provided for our joy is just, it's just amazing. You know, and, and to go through that trip, interacting with, you know, the uh, <laughs> Bryce Canyon, I mean, what, uh, what an amazing place. And coming across central Utah and just seeing the expanse, <laughs> just goes on forever. And then coming into the arches and I mean, you just, you know, you, well, you know, it's just, it just touches us all the way. And then we ended that day, that long day with, with the arches, of hurrying to that last section of arches where there were about five or six that we hoping to take pictures of. And fortunately, I got beyond the auto stops before I turned into the landscape area, but Lois turned towards and stepped as, anyway, caught her foot on the auto stop and wound up crunched on the concrete. And I could hear it, you know, it was just, uh. and then uh, we, well, we rushed her into the Moab General Hospital and they were wonderful. But I couldn't help but think of that, that here where you spent the whole day of praise and thanks and, you know, talking about all we're seeing. And then we end the day this way. 
And yet at the same time, you know, unlike Paul and Silas who didn't have any help, there was great help. Professional nurses who took care of Lois and who were generous in their time and in their concern. Uh, you know, we were just blessed in every way. And Lois is so glad to be here today without all the bruises and everything else that accompanied her for several days. She still has two broken ribs, but they're coming along, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's a day of praise and prayer and, and an evening of praise and prayer because it just turned out, you know, in spite of everything else, it turned out wonderful for her because she was taken care of. Well, it was, a, again, another thing that attracts me out of this verse is that uh, Paul and Silas had all these other prisoners listening to them praise God and give thanks. And, and uh, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns and the other prisoners were listening. And it just dawned on me in a sense. I thought it was a decent thought. You and I are contagious. And I'm not talking about COVID. Other people notice us. They notice our attitude, our words, our actions, our inaction. There are those times when they see someone who responds much like they do. But the remarkable thing and most consistent is that they see us as different people for we react more in line with the spirit of Christ than our human spirit. And when I talk about this, I'm not thinking of what I was taught when I was in college, Bible college. You know, you kind of go around mincing around your life thinking that other people are watching you and therefore you better be, you know, you, you think, holy cow, this is abominable. Uh, but at the same time, there is a real sense in which people do observe us. And that's, that's fine. We observe others as well. You know, it's just part of life. And... Uh, and I think for us, the incredible thing is with a life that is motivated and, and centered on God, and a life that has been moving in that direction and to honor Him and to be transformed by Him, you know, there's so much in our life that is giving honor to God of which we are just not aware. And yet they see it. I mean, I'm sure every one of us has had someone say, thank you for, and you think to yourself, when did I do that? You know, it's just one of those wonderful things that God blesses us with. I always come back to that scripture in Philippians, interestingly, to this church. God is at will, to, will and to work for his good pleasure in us. And that's just astounding that through us such light can be seen. I ran across a story of author Colleen Townsend Evans told of a time when she felt the urge to take a copy of the book A Man Called Peter to her friends. Some of you may remember A Man Called Peter. It's that true story of a poor Scottish immigrant named Peter Marshall who became chaplain of the United States Senate, and sub subsequently, one of the most revered men in America. The book became the number one bestseller when it was published, I couldn't believe it, in 1951. <laughs> Later, it was released as a popular motion picture, which I also saw. For some reason, Miss Evans felt that Neil and Connie would profit from reading this book. It's just a sense. So the next evening after she made this gift to them, the husband, Neil, called Colleen and demanded to know why she had brought them this book. Colleen could only say that she felt God had sent her to deliver it. Neil insisted that she come over to, her, to the house right away. Colleen found Neil and Connie in the midst of a crisis. The previous night, Neil came home from a business trip to discover Connie with another man. He asked Connie for a divorce. The next day, they began discussing the affair and the end of their marriage. When Neil picked up the book, Colleen had dropped off and began flipping through the pages. As fate would have it, or as God would have it, 
he came across Peter Marshall's sermon on the woman caught in adultery. It's in John 8, 1 through 11. And Neil read the sermon through, and his heart was transformed by its message of forgiveness. He and Connie had the most heartfelt and healing conversation they'd ever experienced that night. And Neil ended his story by saying, I don't know how to say this, because this has never happened to us before. But God came into our lives last night. For me, the story says that as, as we are faithful to God's directing in our lives, our in, interacting with others, ideas that come to us <clears throat> that may be a benefit to others, it may be God indeed prompting us just to simply pray or to send a note or to send a book or to make a visit or a phone call or, you know, whatever. Because in that prompting, God is aware of what's going on and wants you to take part in his ministry. It's, but, it's, you know, it's not our ability so much that simply our faithfulness that gets things done. And the final thing out of this is who needs to be set free? And we know in this story, to make things short, the jailer and his whole household were set free. There's that wonderful novel and movie, The Shawshank Redemption, in which the wrongfully accused prisoner named Andy keeps talking about finding hope in prison. His buddy, Red, good old Morgan Freeman, doesn't want to hear it. He thinks it's foolish to look for hope in those circumstances. One day, Andy barricades himself in the prison warden's office and played the Mozart opera over the prison PA system. The music is so beautiful that the prisoners, even the hardened, angry, violent ones, pause to listen. And as Red listens to the opera, he understands a bit of the hope that Andy feels. He said, I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made these walls dissolve. For the briefest of moments, says Red, every last man at Shawshank was free. And the prayers of Paul and Silas gave the prisoners freedom. The prayers of Paul and Silas gave the, j the jailer in his household freedom. And it's such a wonderful story that Luke remembers it, and he makes sure it gets included in his volume called Acts, as he shares with us some of the episodes from Paul's work in the expansion of the church. It's always my hope and prayer that this prayer, this story can be remembered, and we will, like them, trust God in our weakest and worst moments. We will be able to pray and praise God, not necessarily to receive, but simply because you know that your life and hope are found in Him. He is the center of all true freedom. Amen. Our hymn, number 208. In the black hymnal.
Well, now we have joys and concerns, right? What? Not. Yes, Betty. I, I, uh, I was watching television and the news, and the psychologist was speaking about what to tell the children who survived this horrible event. Uh. And they were talking about, well, let's let them talk, let them listen. And I thought, Jesus said something about the little children. And I thought it was in the book of Matthew. And I looked and I found it. What a relief. Let the little children come on to me. And the, if, you, if you do read it, it is so beautiful and it took it took all that away. They are with him. And um, it's uh, chapter 19, verse 14 in Matthew. Please read it. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Yes, sir. Well, it's a joy to have you in the Lost Pass with us. Yes. Well, it's a joy for us, too. It's been like ever. <laughs> <laughs> What a vacation. Yeah, yeah. What a vacation. I'll pass on the next one like that. Hi, Lois. Hi. Um, you know, I, I, as Ed has already said, what we saw was so beautiful and so breathtaking. You know, you just can't help but praise God. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for my husband who went into the emergency room with me and stayed with me. <laughs> uh, and then my daughter came. She got on a plane and came down and she literally was a godsend. She took care of us. She left last Tuesday. And during this period of time, her mother-in-law has been in hospice and uh, her mother-in-law died yesterday morning. Oh. But I, I thought that was, you know, her husband said, no, you need to go down and be with your mother. I'll stay here and be with my mother. And I, I'm just so grateful. Really <coughs> worked out well. Uh, Cindy, you had your hand up. It was all the parents um, uh. that have lost children, but also uh, I think every time something like that happens, all the people that have gone through it before relive it, and they need that support, and uh, what better place but then in God's house and with God's family. So I know there's been unending prayer for not only this event, but all the prior ones. And, just to keep the whole country, the whole world, really, with all the wars, to the grain and all this, just to take care of each other as you want us to. I'm so glad there seems to be a serious discussion going on about how we can help these young people, especially the young males who have been uh, wrapped up in their games and all for two years now with COVID. And it has affected both boys and girls, this, this uh, isolation, and it's just hard to, hard to break through. Um, can't imagine. I mean, our schooling was so different, just so different. Yeah, Arun. Yeah, if you can w wait long enough, ask Doug to show you his, his uh, pictures of, uh, <laughs> sorry, of Jan that he took when she, he had lunch with her down in Florida. And uh, she's looking great. Yeah, it really is.
Yeah. Uh, well, and, and remember the other joy we have today is we celebrate an 89th birthday. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yes, Jim. I have a joy that I have known this lady now for 47 years, and she has been this remarkable, <laughs> shiny example of a human being. Yes. And she has treated me so wonderful since we've been together, and I just love her to death. And I just want, felt like it's important to tell her that, that she has been such a great part of my existence for half of my life. And I just love her tremendously. Thanks, Don. And I do it. And that's my joy. Yep, yep. Well, let's have a prayer together. Our gracious God, thank you so much for your mercy upon us. Thank you that we can come before you and worship and praise you for all the work that you have done in creation and in the redemption work through Christ. Thankful for the gifts we have in him, the spiritual gifts, and we give you praise. Thankful that you are at work in our lives, both to will and to work, to your good pleasure and to our joy. Thank you for Donna and her life and her joy and her witness, pray your strength always on her. We pray giving you thanks for Jan and her service to her mom and praying for your strength to continue with her and her mom and her stepfather. We pray for your grace to be upon Sabine's friends in their loss of her life. And we pray for the DeLima family and the loss of their dear grandmama and mother and uh, ask for your mercy upon them and your peace to come upon them. We pray in the, in the darkness of this time with some of the things that have happened, we ask for your mercy especially to be upon those families, both in Uvalde and in Buffalo who have lost loved ones because of absurd behavior. And we ask for your coming into their lives and granting them grace and granting them strength. And may these start discussions that are important and how to minister to our young people who have gone through such a fragmenting time. We pray for your children throughout this world, grant them strength, meet their needs. In the face of persecution, grant them strength. May they, like Paul and Silas, be enabled to praise and pray Bless our country and bring it, bring it together in a spirit of unity and harmony, a spirit of listening. And now, dear God, we would pray together that prayer Jesus taught us. And we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that in pardon and cleanse within, 
Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Our hymn in preparation for communion, number 332. It is such a joy to be able to be back with you to celebrate this meal with our Lord together and uh, to remember again his grace to us, his gift of life to us, as we see in his, this bread and this fruit of the vine. We remember the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you, take and eat. And after the meal, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sins. Drink you all of it. So shall we pray. God of grace and glory, how thankful we are for your mercy upon us. Bless these elements to our spiritual lives as we partake this day, this bread for strength, this fruit of the vine for a sense of renewed cleansing by your grace. We offer to you our lives and our love. For you in turn, continue to offer us life and love. We pray through Christ. Amen.
let us partake together of this manna from heaven. Let us share together in this spiritual drink of our Lord Christ. Thankful to you ladies who sang. This is a lovely song today. And also the flautist. It was all very good. Well, uh, number 478. We can sing the first verse only. That should be probably enough. I've got peace like a river. being served in Trowbridge, so you can come over and have dessert before you have your meal, wherever you might have your meal. <laughs> As the old saying go goes, dessert is always good first because life is so uncertain. <laughs> Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you so much for this day and for your joy in us. Thank you for Donna and her wonderful life. And we thank you that we can share in this birthday celebration with her. And we ask for your peace to guide us in our days and uh, may our lives continue by your grace to reflect your goodness and your mercy. And we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 